This skyscraper nearly killed 200,000 people in New York. It had a flaw so bad that it could wipe out 18 blocks of Manhattan. All because of St. Peter's Lutheran Church. The church in the corner refused to move, so they had to build around it. We couldn't put a square building up with columns in the corners. They designed the tower with the stilts not on the corners, but at its axis. Structure evidently was not as strong as expected. It said it's 70 miles an hour for five minutes. There goes the Citicorp building. Here I am, the only man in the world who knew this. Crews worked overnight in secret to fix the issues. Nobody knew that the building was troubled for 17 years. This is the story of Citigroup Center. In 1977, the Citigroup Center opened in New York. It became the fifth tallest skyscraper in New York City. But it wasn't just tall, it was special. It soared 915 feet over a small German church, almost like a sentinel standing over a congregation. The structural engineer, Le Mesurier, nearly turned the laws of physics on their head with the unique stilt design. Anyone looking at the building would feel nervous. It certainly didn't look steady. But Le Mesurier was confident. He swore the building would stand the test of time. Just a single phone call from a brave Princeton student shattered his confidence. Citigroup Center was one storm away from killing 200,000 New Yorkers. This is a tale of innovation, ambition, and bolts. What? Let's investigate. An unusual alliance. In 1973, Citigroup, one of America's biggest banks, wanted to build a skyscraper in New York. It had to be tall, dominating, and bold enough to challenge Citigroup's rivals. After all, this was New York City, the epicenter of global finance. Major players like Chase Manhattan Bank, Morgan Guarantee Trust, and the Bank of New York were ready to challenge Citigroup. So the bank started snapping up land to build a ground office building. It hired brokers Donald Schnabel and Charles MacArthur to buy expensive parcels in Lexington Avenue, E53 Street, 3rd Avenue, E54 Street. You'd think that would be enough, but no. There was a piece of the puzzle missing, and it belonged to St. Peter's Lutheran Church, a little parish set up by German immigrants back in 1905, a nearly century-old institution with deep roots in the community. The church has around 115 members and about 59 attend regularly. And given its location near Billionaire's Row and buildings like 220 Central Park South, some of the parishioners may as well be the most powerful individuals in the world. St. Peter's Lutheran sits on the northwest corner of a valuable plot. It runs weekly food drives and has helped the homeless in the neighborhood for over a half century. And there's the rub. Charity costs money, and that's exactly what St. Peter's Church didn't have. It ran into financial problems and needed funding to survive. This is where Reverend Dr. Ralph E. Peterson stepped in. He knew two things for certain. The church plot was valuable, and Citigroup wanted to build its massive new corporate headquarters there. And that was his leverage. Reverend Peterson had a few non-negotiable conditions. First, the church would keep a part of the plot to continue its charitable work. Number two, the original church building would get a classy makeover with open spaces and easy access to the street. And number three, the new Citigroup skyscraper can't be built directly above the church. Citigroup accepted these conditions and paid $9 million to own prime land, which is $72 million in today's money. But that meant tackling an intriguing challenge. A brilliant solution. This is where a structural engineer William Le Mesurier comes in. Le Mesurier built nearly 30 major projects, including Boston City Hall, the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, and the National Air and Space Museum in DC. He had a reputation for creating bold and innovative designs, and he was gonna bring these engineering chops to the Citigroup Center project. First things first, the church. Le Mesurier, along with lead architect Hugh Stubbins, built a new and updated church in the corner of Lexington and 54th Street. Sleek and modern, this church was exactly what the parishioners wanted. Now the dynamic duo needed to design the skyscraper. 
Interestingly enough, Le Monsieur came up with this famous or infamous design while waiting for his meal at a Greek restaurant. He sketched a skyscraper that stood on stilts, and the legs didn't stand in the corner but on the building's axis, like a square table awkwardly balancing on crutches. Somehow, this ridiculous sketch became a full-fledged building, but how did Le Monsieur achieve this feat? Construction of Citigroup Center in April 1974, construction kicked off on the Citigroup Center with stilts planted firmly on its axis. But the million dollar question on everyone's mind was, would a skyscraper supported by stilts hold up? To silence his critics, Le Mesurier came up with a series of novel fixes. 1. V-shaped braces. He added huge V-shaped braces stretching eight stories high on all four sides to link the stilts with the floor beams. 2. Welded joints. Each chevron brace was prefabricated and welded floor by floor. That meant the skyscraper was balanced and surprisingly lightweight. Lightweight? Sure. Steady? Not so much. 3. Tuned mass damper. When 75 miles per hour winds blew through, the building swayed a whopping 22 inches. That's just enough to make you pray you're not on the top floor. To counter this, Le Missouri installed a 400 ton tuned mass damper. Picture a giant block of cheese, costing 1 to 1.5 million dollars, sliding side to side, canceling out the tower's sway. If the skyscraper went left, the TMD went right. Together, the chevrons and the damper saved Citigroup nearly 5 million dollars. But these cost savings came at a cost. Blunder after blunder. With innovation comes risk. When you don't stick with safe and established engineering principles, you leave room for massive mistakes. At least that's what Le Mesurier faced. In June 1978, Diane Hartley, a Princeton undergrad student, wrote a thesis on the Citigroup Center. So I started uh, doing my technical evaluation of the building, which really entailed my replicating the design calculations and comparing the design two stresses which the ones that were noted on the structural draw. While working on the thesis, Diane made a terrifying discovery. The Missouri had only calculated for winds hitting the tower on its faces, completely ignoring 45 degree quartering winds. Diane frantically called Le Missouri's office just under a year after the skyscraper's completion. But would a rock star structural engineer and his firm really believe a mere student's word? Turns out, Le Missouri would. His first instinct was to ignore Hartley's observations, but he gave in and investigated. To his horror, all three of his innovative touches were in trouble. Number one, the V-shaped braces he was so proud of, they weren't designed to handle quartering winds. One side of the chevron brace experienced nearly double the pressure while the other side bore almost none. He decided to investigate further. The Missouri traveled to Ontario to meet Alan Davenport, the world's number one wind engineering expert. Davenport's wind tunnel test delivered a harrowing verdict. Quartering winds generated 40% more stress on the tower's joints. Number two, the welded joints? Turns out they're not welded. Welding humongous steel column sections? Not easy. Le Missouri spoke to an engineer with US Steel who said he wouldn't have taken on such a job, especially with full penetration welds. Just confirmed, he called his partner. He said, well, didn't you know? Bethlehem Steel, who built the building, came and they offered $250,000 back to the bank if, if they could redesign a different way of connecting these things. Le Missouri frantically contacted the construction company, praying that somehow accounted for quartering wind loads in their bolt calculations. They hadn't. The number of bolts was calculated only for straight winds, reducing the tower's structural integrity by over 60%. This meant that the tower would collapse in a 1 in 55 year storm or an 87 miles per hour wind. And that's not all. Third, the TMD that wouldn't function during storms. Le Missouri went back over the details and uncovered yet another icing on the shit cake. The TMD, installed to counter the Citigroup's sway, lacked a crucial backup. This might seem minor, but power cuts were common during storms at that time. 
Without power, a TMD can't function. This meant nothing would control the tower's sway. This was on the tail end of July, and hurricane season was around the corner. The tower was also plagued with other, less intense issues. For example, the innovative Le Mesurier wanted to install solar panels and design the tower with slanted roofs. The solar panels proved too expensive, but the tower's now iconic slanted design remained. And that was a problem. During winter, snow and ice would pile up on these slanted roofs and slide off under their weight, plummeting to the sidewalk below. Imagine what would happen if heavy ice dams fell on some unsuspecting passerby's head. Now that Le Mesurier had identified the issues, it was time to fix them. But could they even be fixed? The 90 Day Fix Le Miserier's engineering marvel was a ticking time bomb, a disaster waiting to happen. He could see four ways out of this harrowing situation. First, there was silence. Say nothing, hope no storm ever hits, and pray thousands wouldn't pay the price for his oversight. Number two, shout, go public, spark panic, and watch his career go up in flames. Number three, self-exit, take the easy way out and leave others to clean up his mess. Number four, settle. Quietly fix the problem before his masterpiece became a tombstone. Each option came with its own agony, and for a while, Le Mesurier wasn't sure what he should do. Finally, Le Mesurier's firm broke the news to Citigroup on August the 2nd. The tower was an accident waiting to happen. On August the 7th, Le Mesurier sent the repair plans to the New York City Department of Buildings and secretly briefed the Red Cross, Mayor Edcock, and the Welders Union. To fix the wind braces, Le Mesurier welded 2-inch, 6-foot steel plates onto 200 bolted joints. He also installed backup generators for the TMD, ensuring it remained operational during storms. In the unfortunate event of this fix failing, 20,000 Red Cross workers, along with firefighters, were on standby. Evacuation plans were created for 10 city blocks, while three meteorologists monitored the weather around the clock. Le Mesurier's firm had to calculate the cost burden as well. Most estimates put the total cost of these fixes at $8 million. Out of the reported $8 million, Le Mesurier's firm paid $2 million to Citigroup through its insurance. The tower's repair became a covert midnight operation. Engineers and workers were slipping in after office hours and vanishing before dawn. The employees working inside were lied to, told that this was just routine maintenance work. Le Mesurier was so confident about his solution that he took a vacation with his wife in Maine. As their plane descended toward LaGuardia, he could see crews working on the building's joints, yet no one on the ground had any idea what was happening. To Le Mesurier, it looked beautiful. But that seemed to be tempting fate because there was a close call. Out in the Atlantic, Hurricane Ella was brewing, with winds reaching around 125 miles per hour. But fortunately, the storm miraculously veered off toward Canada, sparing New York from disaster. Phew. In 90 days, the repairs were done. The tower was stabilized. Le Mesurier averted the disaster and saved 200,000 lives. No one in New York ever realized how close they came to a tragedy, until the silence broke. In 1995, Joe Morgenstern, a New Yorker writer, was at a cocktail party, and he overheard Le Mesurier casually admitting that his mistake nearly killed a few hundred thousand people. Morgenstern immediately arranged an interview, and Le Mesurier eagerly agreed. He'd been waiting for this moment since October 1978. Joe's The 59-Story Crisis exploded into public consciousness. Far from destroying Le Mesurier's reputation, the revelation transformed him into an engineering legend. His moral courage became the gold standard case study for engineering ethics in courses worldwide. Le Mesurier proudly declared that his fortified tower could survive a 1 in 700 year storm. We reached out to Professor Hedegaard, assistant professor at the University of Minnesota Duluth, to determine whether these fixes were necessary or effective. So if you are underestimating that tension, that pulling force, and you say, hey, four bolts is good enough, 
uh, then that can be a major issue. Even with the more recent and accurate wind load data, Professor Hedegaard believes the emergency fixes were absolutely necessary, confirming that Citigroup was a disaster waiting to happen. And the current fixes are effective. Shockingly, New York's building safety standards had never required quartering wind calculations, and this oversight was only corrected in 2008, a year after Le Miserie's passing. Now, the tower is no longer synonymous with Citigroup. The institution sold it to Boston Properties in 2001 for $725 million while still operating through leased spaces in the skyscraper. Boston Properties made a major profit from their investment in 2018 when they sold 45% of their stake in the tower, which was valued at $1.45 billion at the time. Now renamed to 601 Lexington Avenue, the building is one of the most valuable and iconic properties in New York City. But behind the profits and business, questions still remain. Was there a better way to design this skyscraper? Do you think Le Missouria was right in carrying out the entire fix in secret? And was the project really worth the effort and stress? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe for more.